Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. It's lovely to see you. Thanks very much for coming. Um, and welcome to Pathways. This is the uh, third session. So uh, my name is Carl Wallace. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the head of festivals here at the Arts Council. Um, and uh, we'd just like to welcome you to the third of four sessions of, of Pathways, which has been taking place um, over March and April time this year. So um, I just wanted to uh, just take a moment to welcome you and to um, cover a few points. My apologies if you've been before and you're, you're hearing this as repetition. I just want to make sure everyone's aware of uh, some of the things that we're doing in, in, in festivals, just so you have an update. So we just want to let you know that we're, we're hosting a clinic which is a festival information clinic, uh, specifically about Arts Council funding available to festivals. Um, if you haven't signed up already or you haven't attended the previous festival that happened um, last week, then there is a repetition of that festival on Friday the 9th of April and my colleague Adrian Colwell, who you'll know well, is on the call. He can um, certainly sign you up to those clinics if that's helpful. The other two things to let you know is that um, we'll be coming back to the sector and talking to you about a resource organization um, consultation. So we are developing research at the moment on a festival resource and we'll come back to you and talk to you about that in more detail. Um, and the other thing to let you know is we're working at the moment with Eamon O'Boyle Associates who presented for us um, a couple of sessions ago on Pathways. And we are developing in partnership with Fulcher Island um, a document for the safe presentation of festivals, which will guide festivals in how to uh, deliver their festival programs safely um, in relation to public health measures and, and COVID. So we will certainly keep you up to speed on that. Um, I'd just like to thank David very quickly. David Teven has um, put these sessions together for us. He's done a brilliant job um, we've had very positive feedback on the last couple of sessions and we're really looking forward to a, a very engaged um, discussion today um, very relevant for all festivals that are currently in the middle of their programming planning and just to thank our contributors today which is um, Porig and Ruth and Kira, Michael, Rob, Kleiner and uh, Peter who is with us in listening mode today and um, creating a reflection for us. So thank you very much. A hand over to David and uh, look forward to hearing your comments at the end of the session. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carl. Uh, and uh, uh, hello to everybody and you're all very welcome here. Um, uh, again, um, I'm gonna be succinct in my introduction. I've, I've, I've uh, spoken about in the previous uh, webinars about the importance of the festival sector to uh, the arts 
in Ireland generally and how much the Arts Council value the particular role festivals play alongside arts officers and venues in providing a, a very flexible and uh, format that allows for arts events of significance on islands in small towns and in larger cities and often working with the arts officers and the venues. So um, festivals are, have been, are, and remain very important for um, the Arts Council. Um, we also in the Arts Council recognize the, the extraordinary breadth of, of, of the festival sector um, that has both um, professional and voluntary um, festival makers, uh, sometimes working together in context of a festival maker, professional festival maker with a voluntary committee, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very complex territory. And we're hoping that in this, um, a webinar we're reflecting that and we're also um, that uh, uh, responding to it and um, there's certainly been an last year this sector um, presented and it was extraordinary and um, resilient in responding very quickly to the challenges faced by COVID um, but we also recognize that it's a festival that is vulnerable um, it's vulnerable because we have small organizations that are stretching themselves constantly and now they're being asked to stretch even further um, so this is what this festival is about. The festival is about trying to respond to this breadth, to this diversity, um, to, to, the, to celebrate the resilience and also to, to, to mitigate that, that vulnerability. Um, so the, 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 the sessions are run along uh, a similar format. We have five 10 minute uh, presentations. This time, one of them is, uh, we have two speakers on one of these sessions. Um, so we would ask everybody to turn off their, to mute uh, if they would. Um, during the session, the usual um, uh, um, uh, format for, for using um, uh, a Zoom call that we're all familiar with now. Um, after the five speakers, we'll have a short question and answers, then we'll have a five minute break, and then um, we will move to breakout rooms. And I'd, today we have uh, four uh, festival makers, Helen Meany, uh, Liz Kelly, Maria Fleming, and Tara McGowan, who are going to moderate those sessions, and Carl, myself, and Adrian, and uh, Danielle Lynch, who, who is a, 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 an academic colleague of mine, will be taking notes in those sessions. Um, and those notes are then put online. So there's a resource for future festival makers and academics to look at. Um, so to turn to today's session, this has been the hardest one for me to curate um, uh, because this is such a new territory, this, this digital realm that we are, um, we, 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 we found ourselves all um, pressed into considering last year. Some festivals chose not to consider the digital realm and, and, and that was a very valid decision for some festivals, others did. Festivals chose to, to, to engage with the digital realm in very, very different ways. And that has been very, very exciting. But it is an extraordinarily um, huge uh, realm to try and engage with um, uh, and to try and encapsulate into to what is an hour and a half session. And I hope that the speakers I have invited today will will in some way provide a provocation and provide some glimpse of the different aspects and the challenges that were faced. Um, uh, festivals working with digital technologies is not new. Most of us would have been involved in social media, using social media to converse with audiences. Some festivals would certainly have been creating film to put on social media. Um, and there were festivals both in Ireland and abroad that were actually engaging in digital presentation of work in advance of COVID. And um, so we must recognize that. But what happened, and I, I would note, I mean, Goway International Arts Festival had it started a few years ago, putting first thoughts on Facebook Live. So it had started to recognize that there would be digital audiences um, uh, as, as well as live audiences. Um, uh, Car Carlo Arts Festival had started using um, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. So in, in their festival programming, although it was it was engaged in person in the festival site. So this is not new, but what was new was this ex exponential increase of the use of digital technologies last year uh, and the use of online platforms. And we all had to go through this extraordinary uh, learning curve. Uh, and all of us, I think, went through different learning curves. And um, a lot of my experience was, because I'm not, no, no longer actively making festivals, was in being an audience for the digital 
and the non-digital, the online and the in-person work this, that festivals created last year. And I wrote a piece from the Irish Times a number of weeks ago in which I tried to, to interrogate that, that position of being an audience. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about, um, um, you know, the, 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 the ha, ha, film and audiovisual recording and how which ways we can do that. And that's certainly a concern of this, this sector. And there's also been, um, you know, the different types of broadcasting that can be used. And I think our speakers will reflect on that a little bit. But I wanted this session to also look at the audience. What is it the audience are experiencing? And how can we as festival makers understand that, that dimension? Because we're so used to understanding festivals in a very real sense of, of, of being in contact in person uh, in, 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 in crowded spaces and, and which is something very particular that communitas, um, uh, that sense of communitas that, that uh, uh, the uh, sociologist Turner spoke about that, that brings people together has been central to our work and most of us have been committed to live performance. So this has been a, a, a very new um, experience. But we are talking about a time now where we're, we're looking at, and people, are festivals are talking about the future being of blended programs. So it is incumbent on us as a sector to understand better what we're dealing with. And hopefully by sharing knowledge today, we can do that. Before I introduce the first speaker, I want to just recognize Annette Nugent, Annette Clancy, Bridge Barker, Peter Power, Stephen O'Leary, and Mark James, the six colleagues whom I spoke to on, during this time, uh, who helped me to try and understand better what we were tackling and, and, and to define this session. So that is by way of introduction. Um, and uh, we're gonna move to our first speaker now. Um, and uh, this is Ke Ke uh, Kira Higgins, who is the artistic director of uh, Great Music in Irish uh, in Irish Houses, uh, which began in 1970, um, uh, which is a, a program of, which it began in 1970 as a program of chamber music events in Castletown House. And over the last 50 years, the organization, organization, excuse me, has stayed true to its commitment to present chamber mu music in intimate spaces for which the music was originally written, away from the more formal setting of the concert hall. However, it has also evolved uh, its operating model, moving beyond the confines of Castletown to program work in other heritage buildings, and more recently in some of the country's iconic modern buildings. So I've invited Kira to reflect upon the organization's most recent evolution, which was presenting Chamber Music Online, and the organization's understanding of the public's engagement of that work. Kira, you're very welcome. Thanks so much, David. Well, let me just try and do the science bit here of sharing my screen. And I'll just, while Kira's doing that, I'd ask you, could you please all turn off your, uh, mute your sound as well? Thank you, Kira. Have you seen this only host all participants on my screen? Yes, we're seeing it. Oh, cracky. There we go. How do I get rid of that? No, it's, it's, it looks fine for us. It's okay for you? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, here we go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be in the presence of so many kindred spirits. I'd first of all, of course, like to thank the Arts Council for inviting me to share some of our own relatively limited perspectives on connection with the digital public in 2020. You see before you a photograph of the magnificent Castletown House, which of course David has already referenced, was the founding and indeed it's the spiritual home of the Great Music and Irish Houses Festival. Uh, the festival has been a landmark uh, fixture in Ireland's classical musical calendar for 50 years now, engaging and we hope exciting our audiences through both good times and bad. It was founded by the visionary David Lang and has brought many of the world's leading musicians to our shores to engage in chamber music performances of the absolute highest quality. And it has equally provided both a platform and collaborative perform, uh, performing opportunities for many of our own Irish artists. Running from 1970, the annual festival in June is staged in a variety of spaces, including both historic and modern concert spaces and beyond. But whatever the stage, the high quality chamber music is always at the core of what we do and our audience at the heart of it all. March 12th, 2020, uh, the day that the Taoiseach stepped out into the podium in Washington is a date that 
none of us will forget. And that's particularly true for the small team of the Great Music and Irish Houses Festival, because that was the date we were due to announce a very ambitious programme of events to mark our 50th anniversary in June. Looking back now, we were lucky in so many ways to have a big birthday to look forward to, as whilst it became very apparent from the outset that live events before our treasured audiences would not be possible, we did have a date to celebrate our 50th on the 7th of June, and that date would not have been possible at any other time or in any other year. And so we marched forward with a plan of action. Our first port of call was with our long-term partners, RTE Lyric FM, with uh, an idea to reach our audiences through radio. And uh, that resulted in something that was beyond our wildest dreams because on June 5th, the full score, one of the flagship programs in RTE Lyric FM, devoted the full program, which is three hours of music to great music in Irish houses. This featured uh, spoken tributes from an array of many distinguished musicians who had performed in the festival across the 50 years and also used recordings, many of it from live uh, experiences of the festival to reach to our audiences. And in highlighting these many magical moments that the festival has created for Irish audiences over half a century, those tuning in, and that was in the region of 40,000, were afforded the wonderful opportunity not only to remember and reflect and think back about what this festival is all about, but also it reached new audiences uh, and they started to learn about what we do each year in June in some of our most historic and wonderful spaces. It was an absolutely fantastic start to our 50th birthday weekend. Uh, we marked the date itself on Sunday, June the 7th by hosting a series of online interviews, discussions, short performances, including a multi-screen performance of Steve Reich's New York Counterpoint by clarinetist Carol McGonnell, seen here on screen. And we had a series of special birthday messages filmed and posted online from artists and very importantly, loyal audience members alike. Our online uh, celebration culminated in an hour and a half long virtual birthday concert from the homes of 17 musicians from Ireland and abroad. We may not have been able to present in the intimate settings we are so lucky to present in each year, but we did give our festival audiences a chance to connect in these very, very difficult times. And if you do bear in mind, a lot of our audiences would have been cocooning at the time. So it was especially important for us to reach out to that, that, that uh, audience at this time. Um, we were very mindful of the fact that a lot of our um, musicians were playing before an audience virtually for the very first time, and they had missed that audience engagement. So true to what we do at the end of every festival concert, we, we had a party for our audiences and for those uh, working behind the scenes. And in fact, one of the, one of the musicians remarked to us at the end of the, of, the, of the party on Zoom that it was the first time he had felt normal or that his pre-COVID performing life was returning to normal for the first time in, in three or four months. So that was that was a, a special moment for us all. Um, we had always hoped to do something live in 2020 and had worked with the Arts Council to presenting in November. But of course, like so many other organizations, we had to pivot again when we found ourselves in another lockdown. However, on this occasion, the one thing in a year of monumental uncertainty was a certainty from our point of view that music and the power of music connected us all. And with a little bit more time to plan on this occasion, with the learnings of what we had uh, learned in, in June 2020, and of course, with the support and encouragement from the Arts Council, we set about creating a special uh, digital concert that we decided to output online on New Year's Eve. We knew it wouldn't or it couldn't be a traditional New Year's Eve concert. And so we thought very, very carefully about what that musical content would be and how it would speak to audiences at the end of a very difficult year. We were very mindful that our audiences would have experienced bereavement, multiple losses, trauma and huge loneliness throughout the year. And we wanted to reflect these experiences through our choice of music and the musicians performing. We took our inspiration from a work of great hope, 
written during a very different type of lockdown, Olivia Messian's Quartet for the End of Time. Much of this work was written in a prisoner of war camp at the start of World War I, and indeed it was famously performed on a brutally cold January night in 1941 before Messian's fellow prisoners. The, po uh, the composer himself described the final movement of the work as one of unfailing light and of unmutable hope, immutable hope. And that is what we wished for our audience as we left behind the challenging year of 2020 and looked to 2021 with hope. Uh, we collaborated with six leading Irish musicians and worked with Red Paw Media and sound engineer Paul Ash Brown to present a beautifully filmed concert from Dublin's Castle Chapel Royal, which was streamed on YouTube premiere on New Year's Eve at 5 p.m. The concert remained online until uh, January 15th, which was the 80th anniversary of the first performance of the quartet for the end of time. And once again, our friends at Lyric came up trumps, uh, broadcasting three of the movements of the Messian on the Lyric concert that special night, uh, thus ensuring a, a further audience reach of 20,000 listeners. And, and so what have we learned? Um, for a, a festival with a a limited budgetary resource to engage digitally and with a very small but nevertheless passionate team we've managed to sustain a really important connection to our audiences in these difficult times through the power of digital engagement. In the early months of lockdown we worked collaboratively with musicians who would engage to perform at the 2020 event to shape a meaningful virtual concert experience for our audience worthy of a 50th birthday. The initial output, whilst relatively basic, saw us engage an online audience three times our annual reach in just one day. This was a big eye-opener for us as a festival that is, has a relatively limited audience reach due to the, the performance spaces and the confines of the performance spaces we occupy. And whilst we've always enjoyed uh, a, a greater audience reach through the courtesy of Lyric FM and Occasion BBC Radio 3, we saw endless possibilities with a new online audience, uh, very possibly for the first time, I'm embarrassed to say. Um, our own audience profile includes many people that may be wary of um, coming back to the live. So going forward, it is unthinkable that this loyal audience base is not con con considered as we as we move to the next festival in June 2021. We realise that from talking to our audiences right. and to our colleagues in the classical music world, that as time goes on, an appetite for streamed concert after streamed concert is lessening. So new ways to engage digitally are now an important consideration as we put final plans into trains. Last slide. We still remain convinced of the fact that music and indeed all the arts connects us to one another. And so in programming certain events in 2021, we are looking now at the times we are living in and creating content that reflects these times. This is a learning, of course, from what we experienced with our New Year's Eve event, where audience feedback to the connection with Messian's music was very, very strong. Whilst we've also learned, we've also learned how much this takes out of us. So as an organization, we're starting to say to ourselves that we need to cut ourselves a little bit more slack, give ourselves some time and be patient with what we're doing. Um, as festival makers, we have two very potent ingredients to draw on. We have one another and we have our low audiences we have built and we can continue to learn from. If there is anything that we have learned from these times, it is to engage with one another and our audiences more than ever. We're really lucky as festival makers to have been afforded this opportunity to meet and listen to one another in these and in previous sessions organized by the Arts Council. And I look forward to hearing everyone else's experiences this afternoon and once again to learning from you all. Thank you very much. Sorry, thank you very much, uh, Kira. That was uh, that was terrific, um, okay. uh, um, I, and it's really interesting to see you talking about your partnerships with Lyric, because what has come up in the past has also been, um, in ter terms of traditional Irish music, have their partnerships with uh, the uh, the Music Archive, Irish Music Archive, and for film with the Irish Film Institute. So those partnerships, which for those who, who who might attend the next. Um, session of this uh, webinar series. It is about those partnerships and mm -hmm. that networking. So it's really interesting to see it coming up here and, and, and ending with the idea of, of, of kindness being, because I think at our last session, we, um, um, uh, uh, Rowan um, 
who was speaking to us about the festivals in, that she organized in the UK spoke about kindness as well. So um, it's a nice reminder uh, that uh, kindness to yourself, not just mm -hmm. uh, kindness to others is, is really important. So thank you very much, Kira. Um, thank you, David. And, uh, we're going to move on now to, to Clea Namar. Um, uh, Clea is somebody I know for a long time. We're both sort of based around Clonmel and have worked professionally together. Um, and she's now the artistic director of Junction Festival, which is an organization I was involved in myself for many years. Um, Falling as it did in midsummer in 2020, Clonmel Junction Festival uh, included a mix of in-person and online events. Uh, the online program uh, included some live live events and some live broadcast of pre-recorded events. In the aftermath of the festival, uh, Cleaner worked with a consultant to interrogate the data that they could collate from the different social media platforms they had used to, uh, to attempt to understand who this work had reached, how they had engaged with it, um, and, and also so that that could inform how they planned for the future. So uh, I've asked Kleena if she would share some of this very important work with us today. And uh, you're very welcome, Kleena. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm just going to go to sharing my screen. Um, and I hope you can all see that. Yeah. Can you see the screen? Great. OK, so as David said, um, my name is Cleana Marr. I'm the di artistic director of Clonmel Junction Arts Festival. Um, I worked on the very first festival back in 2001 with David, um, and it started off as a celebration in Clonmel of touring theatre with live music in the evenings. And it has grown from that to be the premier festival in Tipperary, uh, in Clonmel, our, uh, Tipperary's largest town. Um, and I suppose in a, a in, in a county that is sort of a large county and has a lot of different types of populations, um, it's been quite important in terms of growing the infrastructure of the arts in the region. Um, there's been a lot of different, or I suppose, a lot of changes in personnel since David uh, departed in 2015 and I came on board in 2019. Um, and I suppose the 2020 festival was to be my first real full festival. I'm just trying to move my screen to the next one. So um, again, sort of like uh, Claire was just saying, I mean, just on the cusp of um, uh, the COVID shutdowns, we had just launched our early events brochure and presented to kind of partners, um, sponsors and festival friends about two of our flagship projects. We were planning to return to producing live events, producing live theatre in 2020. So uh, one of the projects was a site-specific piece in a local military barracks and the other was a music and theatre uh, presentation called The Boatman of Clonmel. Um, so obviously just after that date, uh, that was um, the 3rd of March last year, so I suppose from mid-March um, as things, as, as the dominoes started to fall it became apparent that certain things wouldn't happen. Um, and we set about replanning the festival. Um, our initial reaction was to have um, a number of placeholder events uh, at the time of the festival in July and to move the live elements to the autumn. And we moved away from that quite quickly, I suppose, as we were going through, you know, we were paying the contracted art artists and we were discussing with the artists that we had ideas and possibilities about what we might do instead. Um, the production manager was looking at the technical options and I suppose one of the one of the things that guided um, what we decided to do was the fact that we get uh, quite substantial funding from Tipperary County Council. And unlike the Arts Council, they had a sort of a different set of criteria. They wanted what we did to be public facing um, and they wanted it to be very accessible to people. They didn't want us to have anything that brought people together. They really wanted minimal audience contact. And of course, this was in sort of April, May of last year when you know, we, we didn't really know what would be possible in July. Um, we decided to move ahead with a planned um, event at the end of April for Poetry Day Ireland. So we planned to have a really, really simple uh, 
online live event um, live onto Facebook on uh, the 30th of April. And it was really wonderful for us because it was an unmitigated disaster. The poems themselves were gorgeous, um, but we had big problems with our comms. We were all communicating using different systems. Uh, the website crashed because the volume of people logging on simultaneously was too great. Uh, it, you know, we, we discovered how bad the broadband in the Clonmel vicinity actually is. So it definitely led to, um, you know, uh, I suppose an interrogation of what we could do in the summer, but also, you know, it led to one of our other um, elements, which was we, we did a publication of the poems read as part of that poetry morning. And we sort of did a series of banners throughout the town centre with a line from those poems. So I suppose one of the things that we that was useful to me was um, just before the festival last year, we'd had the Changemakers Conference and I'd attended a workshop with Ali Fitzgibbon. And she had mentioned how when you're faced with changes and decisions within an organization, it really helps to just go back to have a solid mission statement and to go back to the mission statement. So as I was planning um, what we were going to do for 2020, I kind of went back and said, well, we're, you know, our mission is to engage the audiences in Clonmel with art and it's to support local artists and to bring national and international artists to Clonmel. So one of the first things we did is we continued with uh, a project that we had uh, funding from Creative Ireland to do in association with Music Generation, which was to do a series of uh, rock ensemble uh, workshops and art on and art workshops with young people. Um, we had originally planned to do them by Zoom and then we that was the period where you had all that Zoom bombing. So we moved to StreamYard. So it really helped kind of impact the platforms that we were using. Um, and then we looked at the other projects that were that had already been planned for the festival. I mean, we had we had a very solid program in place, um, and a lot of the conversations were based around what what do you feel comfortable doing? So, for example, the School of Looking and Cleary and Dennis Connolly they're based in Paris. They were definitely not going to be traveling to Tipperary to do a festival that involves putting helmets on your head. So we spoke a lot about what they could do and they put together a series of seven uh, documentary videos that we streamed throughout the festival. Um, Roger Doyle was to participate in and did participate in a symposium, um, but he was also going to play a concert concert and he wanted to uh, he wanted to premiere um, a piece from the I Girl opera, electronic opera that he'd written with Marina Carr. And he was really, I suppose, fervent that we should kind of keep this element of the program. So we commissioned uh, Trish McAdam to make a video, an art video of an aria from I Girl. Um, we supported sort of a local ensemble, Clonmel Laptop Ensemble, who did a live concert. We set up a studio in the centre of Clonmel with a lot of COVID distancing. We recorded content there. We kind of knit things together. So we had a mixture, as David said, of live streamed work, of pre-recorded work that we sort of sent out into the ether at a particular time. And then we also had live events in the town itself. So, for example, as well as... Um, as well as a, a series of uh, art trails throughout the town. We had um, the Overlook site-specific theatre project sort of became uh, a, a series of audio stories and portraits on the, the walls of the barracks. So we tried to keep as much as possible um, a physical presence in the town, as well as the online work that we were doing. So we had started as, um, an audience development project with Una Carmody and um, one of the things that we did when we started pulling all the information together is that just because we had we had used the Darkast uh, streaming platform and we had streamed to our own website but also to YouTube and to Facebook with certain events we had asked people to reserve through Eventbrite just so we could sort of keep a an overview of what people were doing we chose for everything to be free people could make a donation if they wanted um, largely I suppose partly because we didn't want to build expectations too high this is possibly based on our Poetry Day Ireland uh, experience, but also because we felt that the communities that we're, I suppose that our audiences are in, were very challenged by job loss and things like that. So we wanted to really look at our reach rather than at our, um, at our box office. Um, I suppose when we examine the figures, when we drill down, the data set that we examined was taken from the 4th of July to the 4th of August. 
And you can see there that uh, of that, so the, the overall figure was almost 70,000 people viewing events within the festival, 13.7% uh, in real time and 86.3% post event. I think and that's quite kind of interesting going forward in terms of how we program things. We won't have anything as long as one month out, but it definitely helped, um, I suppose, to, to, to reach a different public. When we looked at the geography, um, when you look through Eventbrite, you have some very, very specific uh, information coming in. We had Clonmel versus Tipperary versus Munster. When you move to Facebook, you have just Tipperary versus Monster Dublin. When you move to YouTube, you just have Ireland. So it's quite difficult to compare like versus like. Again, one of the statistics that depressed the production manager was the fact that um, such a high percentage of people engaging with the digital events uh, did so by phone and tablet. Um, it's, you know, when, you, when you've put a lot of thought and consideration into the production values and the quality of the sound in the picture, you'd hope that more people would kind of look on a PC. And again, that's probably something that will be inf that will inform the messaging that we have going forward. Um, however, a positive statistic, you know, we were worried with that sort of almost 70,000 views that a lot of those were like the three to 10 seconds. But in fact, we had over half, we had 59.4% of the events were watched as an entire piece as opposed to 40.6% with a partial watch. Um, and the events that we had were between 10 minutes and 90 minutes long. So there were a lot of different uh, lengths of, of kind of event there in that. Um, I suppose some of the post event watch uh, can be explained by this map. So right at the center there, you have Clonmel in blue, which is where you have strong broadband and the orange uh, are the areas where the broadband is poor and to be developed. So uh, as you can see, kind of, sorry, I'll go back. So as you can see from this, you know, the minute you get outside the major urban area, um, th there's, there's, you know, there's very, very scant broadband for people. So that, as well as the work that we did with Una, um, looking at the audiences, looking at the potential for future audiences, kind of engage what we're doing this year. So this year, we're definitely going to keep that digital sense that that new audience that you find through digital presentation um but i think we're going to be braver in terms of the the output we're going to be braver in terms of the concerts and the theater um where we're going to have live streams only um we have a capacity building uh, award to, uh, from the Arts Council uh, with funding also from Tipperary County Council. Um, we've, we're building a geodesic dome, which is a specialised um, construction for performance. Um, the sides of the dome should be able to lift up if we need to be in an outdoor configuration, but we will also be able to live stream from the dome. So the idea is that everything we programme in the festival is possible in level five. I think last year we pivoted so much, our heads were spinning and I think back in December, we decided that we were going to, I suppose, make this slightly pessimistic mm. decision to plan for sort of level five and then hope that we can have audiences with that. I can hear Mr. Teven coughing, so I'll wrap it up there. <laughs> um, and thank you very much for your time and for your attention. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Cleana. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this dome um, when it when it appears in the public realm. Um, and again, you know, one of the things we learned last year was that in terms of social distancing and, and the, the public health restrictions, you could be lucky or unlucky. So it's interesting that you're planning this year that you can you can do everything within level five, but that's allowing some part of the uh, these events will be will be available to the public. And I was really fascinated by that idea that 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 um, those figures and how um, the different platforms give you such different information. Um, so uh, perhaps um, our final speaker will touch on that because uh, I know uh, uh, Rob has some experience within um, that area. So, um, Cleana, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, I'll be I'll be watching from from above the hill from my poor broadband area outside of Clonmel, uh, hoping that I can come in and see it, things in reality. Um, so. Um, uh, we're going to move on now to our third speaker, who is a, another multidisciplinary arts festival. So apologies to the, the single art form festivals um, that, that we have such a dominance. But I, I did feel um, that uh, both Kleena in terms of that 
that granular data that was looked at was particularly interesting um, in terms of, of seeing how that could inform the future. Um, but uh, um, Dublin Fringe Festival uh, is the other festival. Is, is, is Ruth McGowan is with us here today from the Dublin Fringe Festival, which has since 1995 positioned itself as an edgy, mold-breaking, frontier-crossing interdisciplinary festival. I hope I got that right, Ruth. Um, in responding to the challenges posed to live performance by the pandemic in 2021, uh, Fringe invited artists to propose projects that incorporated the interactive potential of the internet or alternatively use digital downloads and other media to create events that created a connection with and between the public. Uh, my Fringe experience in 2020 involved me wandering the hill behind my house in the rain, listening to an MP3 and sharing the, uh, the experience of eating a raw egg with 20 further other attendees at an event on Zoom. So I've invited Ruth to share with us her motivation for this decision and how the organization understands the public's engagement with this work. Um, you're very welcome, Ruth. Hi everybody, uh, thanks so much David and to Carl and to Adrian for having us. Um, it's always really great to be among festival colleagues, but especially at the minute. Um, solidarity everybody as everyone wrangles with festival making in the midst of a pandemic. Um, Adrian, I'm wondering if possible, could you share my slides for me? If not, I don't need them. Sorry Ruth, um, I don't think I have a copy of your slides. Um, is that okay? It's totally fine. I can go without them. It's all good. Yeah. It was just the nice pictures, but you're welcome to Google them as I talk about these shows. Um, so Dublin Fringe Festival, we're a multidisciplinary arts festival and a year round artist support organization uh, devoted to art form development and talent development. So our festival is 16 days and nights every September. And year round, we have a workspace and a training and skills sharing program at Fringe Lab, our building in Tiffany Bar. Um, and what really sets us apart, I guess, or what people know us for, is we're a festival of firsts. So everything that happens in the festival program is happening in Dublin for the first time. And the festival program is always uh, two thirds world premieres. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk to you about our curatorial approach um, to work in the digital space and uh, to share some examples of commissioned work made bespoke for our festival last September, which we titled Dublin Fringe Festival Pilot Light Edition. Um, every festival is different, so I can only share how we set about making a festival that would feel like us. Um, and I hope that some of that learning might be interesting or might be useful um, as you all set about making festivals that feel true to you and to the ethos of your festival. Um, so Fringe has a spirit of experimentation in its DNA. A lot of the artists that we work with are at the vanguard of formal innovation and are interested in pushing the boundaries of what performance can be or performance can do. So when it became clear that making our festival as usual would be impossible, we knew who to turn to. Um, artists are very much our compass, so we asked artists whose practice had a focus on intimacy, on play and on formal innovation uh, what we should do. And they immediately responded with really exciting ideas about new pathways to shared experience. We knew then that we could make a festival within the public health parameters that would be satisfying to audiences um, and that would give the artists the resources they needed to get back to work. Uh, crucially, we wanted to make something that would feel true to our festival and that would give audiences the kind of fresh, wild, strange experiences that they come to Dublin Fringe Festival for. And so we commissioned a number of projects that would bring artists and audiences together in new ways. The mission statement for us was to consider the possibilities of the digital beyond work on screens. So how could we create tactile, intimate, sensorial experiences for audiences using technology as the messenger or as the venue? And so we set three curatorial principles. Uh, number one, nothing that was a diluted version of the artist's idea. So something uh, that existed, that this form was the only form that it could exist in. The full artistic gesture of the work could be realized in a digital space. Uh, number two was devotion to real time shared connection between artist and audience. So we wanted to offer embodied experiences where the audience would be active participants. Nothing you could press play on and then walk away and do the dishes in the background. Um, and number three was we wanted to make projects, realize projects 
that you would want to see no matter what the year. Things that would be interesting in 2017 or 2027. Uh, not just pandemic time fun, actual fun. So I'm going to share the details of four of our commissioned works that fit that brief. Um, all of these shows were paid and ticketed and the price point was between five and 15 euro for each of them. Um, a Thousand Miniature Meadows by Luke Casserly and Shanna Mae Breen was a letter that came in the post that contained a set of wildflower seeds. It guided you to uh, a link to download an audio soundscape to listen to as you set off to find a spot near home and plant your seeds. Participation made you part of a nationwide planting project and this spring a uh, thousand miniature meadows are blooming all over Ireland uh, from the Aran Islands to Cork to Donegal. Um, it's sold out at Dublin Fringe Festival but you can get a ticket uh, if you'd like to participate at the Backstage Theatre in Longford is presenting the show this month. Um, next up was uh, Initiation by Matt Bratko and Frank Sweeney. Um, Here's where the raw egg that David was talking about comes in. Um, so it was an audio experience on Zoom. The audience were sent a shopping list in advance and you were required to present all the items on the list on arrival on Zoom. You were checked in if you didn't have everything on the list. Uh, your name wasn't down and you weren't getting in. So uh, it was a sophisticated soundscape that narrated a story of accidental cult initiation and the audience participated in dares that matched the tasks asked of the protagonist. Um, it was checked on Zoom each time in each round and if you didn't do the dare you got the boot and you didn't make it to the end of the initiation. Um, next up was A Rain Walk uh, by Andy Field and Becky Darlington which we co-commissioned in partnership with The Ark and Norwich and Norfolk Festival. This was a weather specific performance. Showtime was whenever it started to rain. So a shiny silver envelope containing instructions to download a soundscape, um, put on your coat and wellies and head out on a walk near home, guided by the reflections of children from Ireland and the UK about weather. Um, so that was another piece of work that came in the post. And then the fourth one uh, was 2050 by Dan Colley and Fanula Gigax. This was an interactive, unrepeatable live performance on Zoom with a different guest artist attending every night and being interviewed by Fanula. The guest artists included uh, Travis Alabanza, Amanda Coogan, um, from all across different walks of life and different styles of performance. Um, and what was really special about that show is it really created a community among the audience. So lots of people came back to see it more than once to see how the show would be different with a different guest. Um, I wanted to share some things that we're still questioning because making work in this way is new to all of us. Um, we're thinking a lot about terminology. Digital doesn't cover the breadth of this work. So we've been using the term remote art experiences. So uh, shows where artists and audiences aren't sharing space, but they're sharing time. Um, we're questioning context how we view and how we talk about these artworks. Um, we feel that remote art experiences like this are an evolving art form of their own. They should be considered that way by audiences and by critics and not reviewed in comparison to a live experience because it is a different thing. We're thinking a lot about hospitality, how audiences can be hosted, can be catered for and welcomed when we don't share physical space. Um, and we're also thinking a lot about upskilling and peer-to-peer -peer learning for artists who may be thinking about making this kind of work for the first time. So uh, our Fringe Lab team have put together a series of workshops to share the skills of the artists that work in this medium with those who are maybe thinking about it or thinking about uh, dipping their toes into making work in that way. Um, for example, we had a DIY live streaming workshop uh, presented by Dead Center. And we have one-on-one -on -one mentorships ongoing with John Gunning, production manager and uh, internet wizard, talking to artists individually about approaches to making work online. And Luke Casserly and Shanna Mae Breen talking about approaches to making work in nature. Um, I think that's everything. Thanks very much, everybody. I hope that was useful.
Well, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, uh, and thank you for your succinct delivery. Um, uh, it, it, uh, I attended all of the four of those shows, as you know, and, and have thought a lot about them. And, and, and I'm also thinking about this, the, the idea, the terminology. I think that's really interesting. I, I think we have to learn a new vocabulary and we have to agree a new vocabulary because, uh, I mean, this morning I was reading about liveness and, 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 and up until the mid 19th century, there was no such that 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 term didn't exist at all because there was no contrast so everything was live that was it so so we tv brought in or a recording brought in the concept of liveness and now we have these multiple types of liveness and last week i was reading another thing about you know and, and this I, I reflect on this in terms of junction festival because i found the liveness when i was watching the Junction Festival events, I was aware of Cleana and Colin and the, 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 the people I knew in Clonmel who were watching it at the same, much time when I attended a festival in Vancouver recently where I know the people, there was a sense of that liveness with them, the presenters rather than the artists. So I, I do think you're absolutely right. I don't have um, um, yet, uh, I think that vocabulary is coming. Um, and, and thank you for, for, for providing us with that provocation. Uh, maybe Fringe will um, produce the, um, the, the, the little booklet with the uh, language for us uh, as part of your, your, your ongoing excellent work. So thank you very much, Ruth. Um, um, so as with all of these sessions, we are moving. Um, uh, I've invited festival makers to give their experience, but I've also uh, endeavored to look outside of our, our, our sectoral concerns and see how, um, what other voices would be relevant to the conversations we're having. Um, and uh, so the next two presentations will be, will be of that ilk. Um, so we're, the, the first one is, is um, uh, in relation to making the work online, I've invited Porik Nocton to speak to us. Um, Porik, as many of you will know, is the Chief Executive and Director uh, of Arts and Disability Ireland, that champions the creativity of artists with disability and promotes inclusive experiences for artists um, with disability. Uh, the issue of access to the arts for people with, with disability is like uh, the subject of arts in the digital realm, immense. And we can only hope to expose the tip of the iceberg here today. However, I felt that it was a subject worth introducing to this conversation as we begin to plan for a future of festival making that is blended. There is an opportunity to include uh, in our thinking an awareness of the presence, needs and desires of this community, or should I say these publics, as it is not a unified group with a clearly defined set of needs, but a diversity of publics with different abilities and disabilities. So um, Porik, you're very welcome and um, uh, um, I'm very much looking forward to your, com your conversation. Okay, thanks very much, David, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen now and uh, tell me if this if this works, and then we'll get started. Is is that on screen? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Um, thank you for having me, David. Um, I feel a bit out of my depth with all these amazing um, festival makers, and I did attend uh, session two of these, this series of, of presentations and found it really useful. And originally when myself and David had talked, we talked about, about me sharing ideas around access for festivals. And the more I, having attended session two, the more I thought, well, actually ADI has just been involved in a, a big summit, which isn't a festival, but in many ways, because it was delivered digitally, um, I can share a great deal of, what happened there in terms of access that maybe you can make relevant and useful to what you do, but also having gone through all of that experience of creating that access, uh, we can, can share and be there as a resource for, for you as festivals. So as David said, I'm Porik Nocton, Executive Director of Arts and Disability Ireland. Uh, so just, I suppose, as a starting point, and it, it's going to be the only, I, I suppose, my just a, a definition of disability. Arts and Disability Ireland uses the UN Convention 
on the rights of persons with disabilities as a definition, their definition. So persons with disabilities include those who have long term physical, mental, intellectual, sensory impair um, or sensory impairments which in interaction with various measure uh, or various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. And I suppose it's during the, the move to digital that we've really felt that in that it's taken quite a while for access to happen online. Um, as I was saying to David, we've still to see an audio described performance uh, originating out of Ireland. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we have seen captioned and we have seen some line, sign language interpreted performances. Um, and I suppose just a little bit on Arts and Disability Ireland, as David said, we champion the creativity of artists with disabilities. And this is um, Roderick Ford's uh, piece, The Spider's House, uh, which Roderick wrote and was presented at the Project Arts Centre it premiered there. It was part of a commission that Arts and Disability Ireland and the project uh, co-commissioned. Um, and it was a, a large scale one from an arts and disability perspective worth 40,000 euro. And it, it premiered on the 28th of uh, February last year and ran until the 7th of March. So we were very lucky to get Roderick's piece, uh, but this is to happen in project. But uh, this was in the days just before COVID. In fact, I remember being at the, the launch night. I think it was the 29th and it was the first night that cases were actually were declared in Ireland. Another aspect of what we do is we, chant, we uh, promote inclusive experiences for audiences with disabilities. And again, these are some examples of pre-COVID. Up in the top, you can see uh, an audio description or audio description in action. Somebody is listening to an audio description of the painting that's been described down in the bottom left. You can see uh, the caption screen for a live captioned performance um, uh, that was happening at the, the National Opera House. Uh, up in the top right, you can see a sign language interpreter interpreting um, Alicia McGivern as we launched their access services at the Irish Film Institute and down in the bottom right is Jess Tom's Backstage in Biscuitland, which is a relaxed performance. And I suppose those are just some very quick examples of access. Um, another big part of what Arts and Disability Ireland does is to, um, uh, we, we um, work to enhance the disability uh, capacity of, our, of the arts sector. And I suppose that we, we and we're always working in partnership. You know, we say that we champion the creativity of artists and we promote inclusive experiences for audiences, all of which we do in partnership. And in many ways, we, we both develop work and we're there as a resource for the sector. And a big part of what we've been planning uh, up until May 2020, we've been planning for almost four years from access to inclusion, which was going to be a live uh, uh, summit uh, around access that was going to happen in um, Dublin Castle. Um, and uh, it was going to have two, two full days of uh, keynotes and, and panel discussions, plus two days of workshops. Um, and that was all to happen in May 2020. Uh, in March, of last year, we decided we had to postpone. Uh, by September, we made a decision that we wanted to go ahead. We had intended to bring something like 300 people to Dublin Castle from across the world. And we knew that our audience, uh, some of them wouldn't be able to travel. Uh, the situation around uh, COVID was precarious, uh, to say the least. It wasn't just an Irish audience. But on top of that, a great deal of the people who wanted to engage in access, some of them actually lost their jobs internationally. Uh, and, and that, so, so in fact, we made a decision back in September that we were going to go online and that we were going to do everything to bring as much of the experience forward as we could. Um, and so 
we decide we had the summit uh, from access to inclusion from uh, the 29th uh, to the to the 20th or sorry from the 9th to the 23rd of March this year I know David spoke of being there and I think some of you were also there as well we had 30 presenters and um, they were they were made up of two keynote presentations five panel discussions three workshops and four evening events um, as I say the focus was access uh, so it was about making access or making content accessible uh, it wasn't about making art by people with disabilities accessible although it could be it was about making art and cultural experience accessible and uh, the other thing about our summit was it was going to be a ticketed event when it was in dublin castle and we decided to stick with that format so it was the the symposium part ran on tuesday afternoons uh, uh, from the 9th to the 23rd and tickets could be bought for uh, 50 euro for one uh, session or 100 euro for the three sessions uh, and uh, the evening events were either free or ticketed uh, through our partner organizations who actually ran them the workshops were were free and I suppose this comes to the, the key Thing was about access was just to, to show you what it looked like. This is a typical conference screen. So you can see our, our speakers in the middle. Uh, you can see me. Um, I've, I've grown a bit hair since uh, since since uh, February, March. Um, and two of our so there's myself, Betty Siegel, and two of our keynote speakers, Emmanuel Van Schack and um, Simon Young. And what we decided to do was because we had a sizable American audience and because the Kennedy Center were our partner, we decided to um, that we did need American Sign Language. We also uh, found that we needed um, we needed a, a British Sign Language. Uh, so we ended up trying to create a screen where we could run the sign language interpreting simultaneously. As a result, we had to pre-record the first 45 minutes of each panel discussion or keynote, and then do the last 15 minutes of Q&A live. Um, and that was to um, not to be too hard on our sign language interpreters. And it also meant that we could cut down on, on technical issues that might arise uh, so and then in the bottom of the screen th this is where we were able to show our subtitles or or cart as a, a speech to text as it's called um, and so this was these were the key pieces of of access that we allowed for we also audio described but because it was a conference and because it basically was talking heads we opted to audio describe in the um, in the looped video that we ran for 10 minutes before. So we did audio descriptions of what the screen layouts looked like and what our presenters looked like and where everything was. Uh, if you were doing um, a theatre production, you might audio describe throughout. Um, however, what did surprise us when we were working to develop this was that in fact, we haven't found anybody yet who's run three simultaneous uh, sign language interpreting uh, and that so technically that was very challenging. Uh, the other thing which we tried to do was some networking and uh, so in between our keynote and our panel discussions each day. Uh, we had two meeting rooms or through bre breakout rooms and one was a, a video chat and the other was a text chat. What was fascinating from the data that we received back from uh, EventCube who managed the conference for us was that actually Irish and UK people didn't participate in the networking. They seemed to disappear and there were a lot of US colleagues who did. Uh, here are some stats on the, the, the audience engagement itself. Uh, we had 
uh, 435 sold tickets, but over the three sessions, 1,336 people engaged, uh, it, it, you know, watched the three symposium sessions. We had people from 21 countries um, across the world. Um, we had a, an average um, time that people engaged in the sessions varied between uh, two, uh, no, 58 minutes and two hours and 55 minutes. And generally people engaged for a little under the two hours. That was what we found. Uh, as I said, the Kennedy Center were our main funder, the Arts Council, British Council and uh, Creative Europe Desk. Um, just so you, you can, if you're interested and you want to follow us on social media, here are some um, of the uh, of, of our social media for Facebook um, Twitter and uh, Instagram. This is my contact details. Now, just one or two things that I want to add in, um, which aren't on the slides because I was having some technical difficulties earlier. We're trying to get it to work. Um, is what I've shown you are examples one minute, of... One minute, Porik. Okay, thank you, David. Um, what I've shown you are examples of, of where we integrated sign language uh, and captioning. Uh, it is worth saying that if you want to pre-record uh, your events, you can actually caption them yourselves. There's a very good video on our, on our website that gives you an introduction to that that was done by Stage Text. Um, and that's part of a series that we did called Access into Action. There's also another video um, presentation that explains how to write accessible um, introductions, which gives you an introduction to um, audio description. And then I suppose just key learnings. We did a launch event in February just so we could test everything. And we did have problems, as has been alluded to earlier on. We found that fathers didn't work on our on our Q&A box and um, <laughs> so it crashed and um, we did pre-record everything as I say to allow ease of access and to make the access more smooth we did try out 16 different uh, platforms to find one that was accessible enough for us um, and we settled with EventCube uh, who were able to ticket and manage our, our conference online and have also been able to create a post on demand offering of all the videos. And then lastly, um, I would say one of the things and it's been mentioned earlier on and David's mentioned it as well, I would encourage people if you are trying out different formats for festivals or events of any sort, go and try other people's. It'll give you a really, really good sense of what people can cope with. And the other thing I would say is with our um, three afternoons of um, symposium sessions, our four evening sessions and our three workshops, we actually think over the three week period, we had just about reached saturation point with our audience. So it is something to be really, really conscious of. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you very much, Porik. Um, uh, and it's interesting you bring up the um, the idea, the, the the fact that ADI works in partnership, um, much like we've seen uh, in terms of of the music with great houses, uh, or sorry, great music with Irish houses. The, the the partnership with Lyric. These partnerships are so so important. Um, and um, I, I would certainly urge. It was one of the things I learned at the um, conference. Um, which, which I, I, I think might be worth sharing for festivals is that um, is that it's okay to start small in terms of of introducing initiatives within the festival um, that support access for people with disability. And the other thing was uh, a message, and I did attend one of the breakout groups, and I would agree with you, it was it was exclusively Americans that were there, so I would I would verify those statistics. Um, but but one of the feedback there was that ask the people in your community, sort of I'm thinking maybe you know that 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 it it's okay not to know what's needed. Um, so be, being aware of who's in your community and reaching out to them and asking them what do they need. 
not presuming that you you know what you need, but then also going to ADI if you if you do feel that you want to take these steps. Uh, I know Porik and the team are um, are incredibly resourceful, um, and it was lovely to see a picture of Biscuitland, which was a production that uh, we spoke about, which which I saw in Edinburgh myself and absolutely loved. So congratulations for bringing that to Ireland. So um, we're going to move on now to. Um, uh, our final presentation um, before we, our short question and answers and then uh, moving into the breakout rooms. Um, uh, like the festival sector, the art centres around the country um, have also been on uh, a learning curve of digital possibilities uh, since the public health guidance, guidelines were introduced in March 14th, 2020. Responding to this challenge, Michael barker Caven, uh, the Artistic Director of the Civic in, uh, in Tala, established Project Protein, a training and mentorship program for artists who wanted to better understand the possibilities for creating and disseminating work online. The Civic, uh, Civic's partner in this program is uh, The Space, uh, which is a UK organization that uh, has been in existence for a number of years prior to COVID, uh, and that was working to support artists to make art and reach new audiences using digital media content and platforms. So they brought in expertise that, that was already there. So Michael is, uh, is joined by the Spaces digital producer and social marketer, uh, Robert Lindsay, uh, who specializes in helping arts organizations to use digital media to engage meaningfully with new and developing audiences. So Robert and Michael, you're very welcome. Thanks, David. Um... I think Rob's unmuting there. And we thought what we would do, hi everybody. And it's been fascinating to, as always, sit with colleagues in all the disciplines and listen to the amazing um, strides that people are making and, and the remarkable bravery to, to find new ways of making this work work across all kinds of new mediums that are, are very fresh to everyone or developing in front of our eyes. So we thought what we would do, um, especially after you've had um, such great presentations to just have a conversation live and see if we can actually do a double act without dropping dropping the bar um, and and just touch on some of these key issues because I think for everybody the obvious thing to do is start off by saying is that you know we all feel each other's pain and confusion and and it's really important to acknowledge that to yourselves whatever the size of the organization the pressures are incredible um, and everybody is being asked to suddenly materialize this great mystery called digital out of nowhere for many uh, in front of a great a sort of cavern that's opened up in this global crisis. And it's a case of sink or swim. It's not the ideal way to learn a new craft. And, and we've all been told you've got to run when you don't even know where your legs are or if you've got any legs or what your legs mean. So um, my son Rob just wanted to just dare to throw open some some thoughts for you in conversation about things that maybe even we're not even daring to admit because we don't want to to admit in, in public I don't know that or should I know that or do I understand that uh, and and it's really important to say there is no rule book out there I mean just to put everybody on notice I really think this is important there is no right way and wrong way but there are certainly some precepts and ideas that I think are really important to bear in mind. And we thought we'd try and touch on some of those. And one of those straight away is obviously the fact that this, and, and Ruth was touching on this, that this idea of digital is very dangerous for simply the fact that everybody nods sagely and thinks they know or should know what that word means. Um, and, and then goes, Christ, what is it? And moves on as if somebody else knows. Uh, and it isn't one thing. Uh, and it's not of the things that many of us have been told. And it's certainly, to be blunt, and this is my first provocation, it's not cameras and links and streams. You know, that's putting the old adage, the cart before the horse. Um, and maybe the simplest way to call it as a possibility, as Ruth was touching on, is remote audience artist engagement. And that's really what we wanted to talk about. So um, hi there, Rob, you can hear me all right? Here we are trying to talk, talk digitally. Um, I, so for example, let's kick off and just, and dare touch on something, which is there's a, there's a real difference, isn't there, um, between broadcasting and social media engagement. And there's a lot of confusion around that, I suspect, because these words are used and banded around. Um, and it's also important that there are lots and lots of different types of thinking you need to do. So the difference between, for example, followers 
viewers, audiences, communities. Again, words that come around to us, but they are very different online. Yeah, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And I, I think in many ways, broadcasting sometimes gets seen as being the bit that's got all the exciting bits in it. It's producing something, it's pulling something together, you know, creating something and putting it out in there into the world. But there is a whole other half to that process, which you do get on social media. Um, I think it's interesting to look at the different metrics that get used for activity online. So people might talk about followers. They might talk about those as, you know, they are the people that once upon a time agreed to look at what we publish on a particular account. Um, but that's similar to the people that signed up to an email list. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're opening the emails that we send them. Um, we've then got viewers. We might be looking at viewers for a particular piece of content or listeners to a piece of audio on SoundCloud or wherever it might be. And again, that's not the same as your followers either. That might be people encountering something embedded somewhere else on a blog or shared by someone else. Hopefully people are seeing things embedded in other places and shared in other places. Um, it's a really important way of reaching new people. So viewers can be completely different. Community is a word that's been used a lot, which is fantastic. And I've seen great things done across the festival sector where people have said, it's not enough just to chase numbers for individual pieces of content or for particular channels or platforms people do want to recognize that they have an active local community and it's wonderful getting views from overseas and new territories but there might be a particularly active community that they still want to really recognize and make sure that they are fulfilling their their, their responsibilities i suppose um within the creative sector and so yeah that community might be similar to offline similar to in the real world Online, it might be the people who are taking action on an ongoing basis. They are supporting us whether they know it or not. They are liking multiple pieces of content, sharing, having conversations, engaging in comment sections, retweeting, all sorts of things like that. People who are motivated to take action, hopefully share your materials with potentially new people. Um, and then uh, exactly as Michael said, there is no kind of rule book. There is no right answer to a lot of this. When it comes to defining the word audiences, um, those of you with a marketing background will know that's the tip of an iceberg that splits down into a number of different, a number of different branches. That was a horrendous metaphor, apologies. Um, but this, this idea of audiences is absolutely up to you to define and to prioritize. It may include views for a tentpole piece of activity you might be looking at followers for growth on a new platform you might be looking at your community and trying to get shares and embeds you may be breaking it down even further again looking at filters such as geography or particular demographics that you're trying to reach um but it is it is you know it's all possible but that is that definition of audiences is a decision that needs to be um made by by you and your teams and then ensure that your behavior online does recognize that yeah. Bearing, I mean, bearing all that in mind, Rob, you know, should we speak, can you speak briefly about, um, you know, the, how important it is to take some time to really strategically think about your priorities as an organization, both in terms of your core objectives, but also in terms of what you can and can't achieve and how that planning is so important because there's a, an aspect of this which is really important i think to bring forward that you have to take an active ownership that works both ways because if it doesn't if you can't manage to to facilitate that or it's 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 not something yet you fully grasp it's very important to go down into that one about active ownership works both ways because if it doesn't it doesn't work at all yeah yeah absolutely right every single thing that we're putting out into the world we're doing so in order to generate a response. There will always be more opportunities online than we can possibly take up. There will always be more platforms than we can sustainably manage. There will always be more people in more places that we could conceivably offer more creative brilliance to. Um, you, you do need to really have a look at what is gonna generate the responses that you need, what's gonna, what's gonna generate impact. Um, and yeah, whatever response that might be, you might want audience feedback or support or press attention. You might be looking to fundraise or get exposure within a particular community, whatever it is, um, you're trying to get a response and you need to remain an active part of that response. You would not put out a press release and then ignore the emails that it generated or put something out to generate a conversation and not take part in that conversation. And 
whatever story you put out will have a life as long as an audience wants to keep talking about it as well. If they're still talking, uh, sorry, if you're still talking and they're not engaging, you're putting your energies in the wrong places. And conversely, if people online want to talk to one another that for longer than you can hang around, they're, they're going to do so without you. And um, it's funny, we were chatting about this the other day, Michael, and I said at the time, I'm aware this makes me sound like I'm talking about damage limitation. I'm absolutely not. It's about making the most of the opportunities to maximise the impact of the work that you've put into producing and publishing something online, all that blood, sweat and tears, all that energy, all that headspace, um, by then looking at what are the responses that are being generated, how you're being brought to the attention of new audiences and crucially being prepared for things to move in directions you didn't predict. So um, we talked the other day about the Museum of English Rural Life who got referenced by Elon Musk. Um, I read a blog post by the person that was their social media manager at the time who said it happened on a Friday night as he was sitting down to watch Game of Thrones and all of a sudden Elon Musk made one of their pictures into his profile image and that social media manager knew that his team trusted him and allowed him to engage in a lively back and forth with, you know, Elon Musk is a global figure with about 50 million followers, you know, um, they were able to engage in that quickly and with humour and wit and the rest of um, their contemporaries in the kind of social media arts world had logged off for 48 hours, 72 hours, you know, it made them look all the better for it because they knew what audiences they were trying to reach on that platform and what tone they could take and generating vast amounts of attention that they could not have generated for themselves. They just had that, that trust and that understanding. Um, there's a really nice line I saw, and I'll, I'll say this very, very briefly. This was someone at National Museum Scotland who said recently that um, uh, not all great discussions on social media uh, will make sense in your CEO's office or printed in your board papers that's not where it lives the internet has cultures of its own and there are uh, different things that fly and that soar in different places and you need to yeah know who your audiences are and be prepared for things to go in unexpected directions that's about um really acknowledging your strength in limitation and doing that really well rather uh, whilst also being ready yes. to react with ambition isn't it that actually again coming back to this point about the pressure to think you need to be everywhere at the level of some large organization and somehow competing in that space that can be a grave mistake because that's not your strength your strength may be to really identify how you're going to find a key uh, engagement program and limit it to those strengths and just do it really well rather than thinking that that scale will make a difference and 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 at the same time being ready to react with ambition isn't it yeah, completely, completely. I think I say to everyone that I that I speak to, um, if if we're doing any kind of mentoring with support or anything like that, we always try and establish that people have got agency to say no to things. People have understanding of what it is that they're trying to accomplish and what they're trying to achieve and what their offering is, so that when new opportunities do come along, people can say no. That isn't that isn't right for us. And it's not because we don't have the resource for it. You know, we are applying our resource strategically. And again, time, energy, stress, headspace, all these different things and making sure that, yeah, you're not just spreading yourself too thinly. Um, again, you know, if you, if you set up uh, a presence on every single platform that comes along and then every single one of your efforts is wildly successful, you've got a completely unsustainable, you know you know um bulk of work ahead of you you know if you're going to keep all of those things going it just it, it can't work so even if everything looks perfect it's still better to, to try and focus in key areas really and, and there's also something very important that is very rarely touched on in these conversations which, which we really do need to bring up which is that um there are very true particularities about the scale and power of many of these online platforms and the way they operate. And for example, the, the determinant and the growing determinant of the algorithm. And if you don't deal with this with knowledge, it will certainly deal with you. Isn't that a fair statement, Rob? Yeah, it's a very fair statement. It's a very fair statement. There are different strengths to different platforms and um, they will recognize different, different material will soar or fly on some and will struggle on others. Um, I mean, I should say, 
as well, it's important to recognise that some platforms will provide you with a space to publish and distribute great art and others may simply provide you with a chance to get the attention of audiences and let them know that your art is out there or is somewhere else. Um, but yeah, everything that you're putting out is being silently judged by those algorithms and they are judging it based on the response that you get from audiences. There are, and I've said this a number of times before, there are massive amounts of content posted to all of those different platforms every single day. And those channels want you as a visitor and everyone else to see things that they like, that they enjoy. Um, a follow on social media just means that someone once agreed to look at what you publish. It doesn't mean that you've kept their attention, unfortunately. If you've run a social media account for a long time and you've seen the numbers dip, um, it can be quite easy to, to get despondent. Um, it's because all of those different platforms are taking all of that different content. It's, it's, they are showing it to followers and they're paying attention. They're looking at what you engage with. If you are friends on Facebook with people you went to school with who potentially their political beliefs have diverted a little from your own over the years, it might be that you've stopped engaging with their stuff. If you are friends on there with family members who have just got interests that aren't exactly the same as yours or you know, there's no reason to kind of engage with them. It might be that you don't want to unfriend them because you're going to create a ruckus at Christmas time when the family gets together, hopefully. But, you know, the, it, those platforms have noticed you're not engaging. They've noticed that you're engaging with other content and that, that content is rising up to the top. It's prioritising it. It's acting almost like a PA, taking your incoming mail each morning and shuffling the things that are important that deserve your attention to the top of the pile um, and the other things fall further down. Um, so if you have been managing an account for a long time, it can be easy to get despondent. If you do see those numbers start to dip, if you start thinking we're just not getting the responses for the content that we're putting out there, for the exciting, brilliant things that we're putting out into the world that, that our follower numbers would indicate. Um, I think I've, I've seen a number of people who feel that those platforms, particularly the older platforms, are requiring large amounts of paid promotion in order to make sure that even our own followers see our own stuff. But if you look on things like Facebook, I think it's every fourth post, I think, is sponsored. I think on Instagram, it's between every three and five is a paid for post. That's, you know, that might feel like a lot, but it's still leaving 75% of people's feeds for unpaid organic material from people whose posts they've consistently maintained engagement with. Your friends' Instagram posts don't appear in your feed because everyone in your social group has got massive promotional budgets. It's because they're putting out the stuff that you engage with, posts that you like and that you share and that you comment on. And so I'll say it again, a follow doesn't just mean that someone agreed to, uh, sorry, a follow just means that someone did once upon a time say, okay, show me what you've got. And if the things that you've put out haven't delivered on that promise, you're gonna start getting shuffled down to the bottom. Um, those platforms do need us to see things that we like when we go on there. So it's looking at that. Now I should say that can sound very, um, uh, sorry, pessimistic, but I should say there's really good news because we are the creative sector. We produce and publish stories of emotion and empathy, and we provide unique, often personal experiences that people want to share. Um, you know, those are the things that still have immense currency online as well. So I think we've just got to be mindful that the things that we're putting out there are delivering on the promise that first made someone follow us in the first place. Otherwise, those algorithms will do the awkward work of removing us from people's attention. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does indeed, exactly. And, uh, and it's just you need to deal with that. I mean, these, these Goliaths, these monsters have their own agenda, and they have their own purpose, and they appear they want to give you access to the world. But unfortunately, you've got to bear in mind and be strategic about that, that it's on their terms, and yeah. you've got to manage that. And it's competition. You know, it is competition, unfortunately. I, it's incredibly difficult for, you know, while I say the good news is with the art sector, we're putting out brilliant things. At the same time, we are also having to put out fundraising requests. You know, we might one day be saying, here's a brilliant opportunity for young new writers. And then the following day, we might say, please remember us in your will, because we've got this fundraising campaign going on. You know, there are all sorts of things that might be going out that are not all going to land with the same person you know we can end up diluting the offering that we're trying to put out there to specific individuals or specific audiences and i think it's really important again to try and focus and really understand who it is that we're talking to and not just see social media as well it doesn't cost us anything to put it out so everything ends up getting slung out <laughs> can, really I, 
Can I use that as a point to interject? Um, I have no doubt uh, this is, it seems like we've, we've joined a conversation you've been having, and I think it's a conversation that will continue and is very much part of this program that you're running. And, and that idea that um, you, you just touched on there, Rob, of, 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 of knowing, of having, of getting some understanding of the, I mean, we managed to do rather well talking about online and the algorithm only arrived in after 75 minutes but that is a huge part of the the understanding of this and but i think when i was at the theater forum conference that michael and uh was involved in organizing you were at is is having that some understanding of what the platforms can do but also recognizing who it is you're trying to reach and, 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 and that time spent in advance will be of immense benefit. There are expert, there is expertise out there that can help you with that if the budget will allow. Capacity building funding, which is ongoing this year, is ways in which that, that knowledge can be, can be bought, bought in by the sector if it's not already there. Um, so we're, we're now at 4.30. So um, uh, as I said, we're, the, the intention of this was to give some tastes of some of the different directions. I'm quite sure that in the spirit of kindness and solidarity, um, any of the speakers will be very responsive to contact from the community in, uh, after, this, um, after this. We're also gonna move into a breakout group um, uh, session now. So um, uh, I'd like to really thank uh, Kira, Kleena, Ruth, Porik, Michael, and Robert for their contributions. Uh, it was another incre incredibly rich and diverse um, uh, afternoon. Um, it just reflects the diversity of the arts in Ireland and the richness and the, the strength of this community, um, uh, which, which is hopefully going to see us through that and a little bit of kindness and the hard work that we're putting in. Um, so we do have one, set, one more session in this series in two weeks time. And Carl and I are also looking at the notes and the feedback about, and uh, with a view to seeing how we can follow on afterwards so that we don't, we're not just ending when this is over. Um, so we hope that you will join us. Um, we have uh, um, uh, the breakout groups, which will uh, be uh, Helen and Liz and Tara and uh, Maria. Are, are going to be moderating and I'll be sitting back with Carl and Adrian and we will be listening. So um, thank you all very much for attending. Um, thank you, Carl and Adrian for working behind the scenes and we will um, uh, we'll see you in five minutes. So it's, it's just, um, we'll be back at uh, 16.37 um, and uh, take care.